Good afternoon. My talk will be about the psychological and neurobiological response to beauty and why such evidence of the human person's physiological response to beauty is a reason to hope. I think you'll see some connections between my talk and Sophia's outstanding talk earlier this morning on neuroscience and faith. Hopefully you'll see more of the promises than the pitfalls. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator in this research, Father Joseph Laracy, Assistant Professor of Systematic Theology and Adjunct Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science at Seton Hall for his contributions to this project. Here's an outline of what I will discuss in the talk. First, I'll discuss the theological perspective that truth is beautiful, and that beauty attracts us to truth. Then I'll discuss psychological and neuroscientific evidence supporting the view that beauty attracts to truth. For example, I'll demonstrate that beauty delights, improves well-being, elicits awe, awakens the intellect, fosters more beauty, and inspires love. Overall, I'll conclude with a discussion about why such evidence offers reason to hope. Catholic philosophers and theologians, ancient and modern, have described the attractiveness of beauty for centuries, explaining that beauty attracts because it flows from truth and vice versa. Beauty attracts to truth. St. Augustine, for example, proclaimed, Late have I loved you, beauty so old and so new. You were radiant and resplendent. You were fragrant, and I drew in my breath and now pant after you. I tasted you, and I feel but hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I am set on fire to attain the peace which is yours. Whether in the 4th century or 21st, the great bishop theologians of the church are calling our attention to the beauty of Christ. For example, Pope Benedict XVI, in his homily at the Mass for the inauguration of his pontificate, stated, There is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. The task of the shepherd the task of the fisher of men is beautiful and wonderful because it is truly a service to joy, to God's joy, which longs to break into the world. Overall, we see that the church has proclaimed that truth is indeed beautiful and that while truth is characterized by goodness and beauty, the order of attractiveness is reversed, such that beauty attracts to truth. This relationship between truth and beauty is evident in scientific inquiry. Maybe you, as a scientist, feel that you've been drawn to your discipline by beauty, the beauty of an exquisite equation, the unfathomable life of a star the intricate complexity of the human brain. You may know other non-believing scientists who also feel moved, in a sense, called by the beauty of creation. For centuries, scientists have been enticed by beauty. Ancient Pythagoreans considered the mathematical order of the universe to be the essence of beauty. Einstein's son, Hans, also a physicist, stated that Einstein's highest praise for a good theory or a good piece of work was that it was beautiful. And Nobel Prize winner Frank Wilczek, in his new book, A Beautiful Question, asks, does the world embody beautiful ideas? He answers it in the affirmative, yes. He shares that equations that we propose 
based on aesthetic ideas of what would be the most balanced, economical, symmetrical, turn out to be the correct equations. It turns out that the operating system that governs the world is something we can also appreciate aesthetically. With many scientists drawn by beauty, we might ask the question, when scientists seek beauty, what or whom will they find? We believe that Jesus Christ, supreme beauty, splendor of the truth, is the source of all beauty because word of God made flesh, he is the manifestation of the Father. We find this expressed in the writings of the saints as well. For example, St. Charles de Foucault wrote, all created beauty, all beauty of nature, the beauty of the sunset, of the sea lying like a mirror beneath the blue sky, the beauty of a rare soul reflected in a beautiful face. All these beauties are but the palest of yours, my God. So I talked about Jesus being the ultimate source of beauty. He is beauty because he is truth, and beauty is the splendor of truth. Thus, as scientists, as the world is drawn by beauty, so too are they drawn to Christ himself, to truth. By the way, when I say scientists, I consider not only individuals who pursue research at an academic level, but all people, since research shows that even infants demonstrate forms of statistical and scientific learning. So we know from a theological perspective that truth is beautiful. But what do psychologists say is beautiful? Objective properties such as symmetry, curvature, complexity, and patterns are typically experienced as more beautiful. Scientific theories are experienced as beautiful when they're ordered, coherent, harmonious, with all parts generated naturally from simple principles, and with these parts working together to form a unified total structure. Interestingly, psychologists, such as Jonathan Haidt, have also found that moral actions are perceived as beautiful. Another scholar in the field and author of a book entitled Understanding the Beauty Appreciation Trait, Rhett Deisner writes that whatever is morally good may be perceived as morally beautiful. Now we've discussed how, from a psychological perspective, creation and love are characterized and experienced as beautiful. And from a theological perspective, truth, Christ, is beautiful. So from both a theological and psychological perspective, we might say that truth is beautiful. Now let's go back to how beauty draws us to truth. As discussed previously, the church has proclaimed that beauty attracts us to truth. In psychology, we find that several emotions are elicited in response to beauty, with these emotions explaining the attractiveness of beauty. These emotions include attraction, captivation, fascination, awe, interest, insight, joy, humor, energy, relaxation, admiration, and elevation. Now I'll we'll focus more on specific effects of beauty. Psychological studies have found that beauty is related to pleasure. For example, in one study, participants rated images on valence operationalized as pleasure versus displeasure, and on subjective beauty. Pleasure and beauty ratings were strongly correlated at R is 0.75, as you can see here in the scatter plot. 
This relationship between beauty and pleasure is found in neuroimaging work as well. The receipt of rewards, including palatable foods, social interactions, positive feedback, and money, recruit part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex in the anterior or frontmost part of the brain, shown here in blue. Let's see if I can do that. In line with the assertion that beauty delights and elicits pleasure, the orbitofrontal cortex was also activated when participants viewed pictures that they rated as beautiful compared to ugly, listened to consonant versus disconsonant music, and viewed morally positive versus immoral stimuli. The latter even hints at the manifestation of morality, truth and goodness in beauty, which is in line with Jonathan Haidt's and Rhett Deisner's work demonstrating that moral actions are perceived as beautiful. The nucleus accumbens, a subcortical, or below the cortex, outer layer, the outer layer of the brain structure, is involved in reward processing. This region has also been shown to be recruited during experiences of beauty, such as when participants viewed visual stimuli they rated as beautiful. Overall, such research demonstrates that experiences of beauty recruit brain circuitry involved in pleasure. If beauty elicits pleasure, we can be sure that the world will continue to seek it, to be drawn by it. You probably hear a lot these days about subjective well-being. You'll hear scientists recommend daily exercise, a nutritious diet, and high-quality sleep. You may have also heard the U.S. Surgeon General's recent plan to improve levels of social connection, another important predictor of well-being. Rightly so, there's a lot of attention devoted to improving well-being. Interestingly, experiences of beauty have also been linked to well-being. Exposure to nature, art, and pleasant music have all been shown to predict well-being, resilience, and to buffer against stress and pain. It has been suggested that beauty is at least partially responsible for these effects. In a study examining the effects of a nature intervention, Engagement with natural beauty was found to mediate the relationship between nature connectedness and happiness. Other studies have more directly explored the relationship between beauty and well-being. For example, in both correlational and intervention studies, subjective experiences of beauty have been shown to statistically predict well-being and related factors such as positive affect, meaning in life, and resilience. In an EEG study, the degree to which participants rated paint paintings as beautiful predicted decreased ratings of pain with corresponding inhibition of neural activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, a region involved in the emotional response to pain. Overall, beauty is good for us. Scientists will always promote what leads to well-being. Thus, at least in my opinion, we can expect increased attention to, awareness of, and promotion of beauty in coming years. With an emphasis on beauty, we'll see more widespread effects of beauty, such as the next several effects I'll discuss. Beauty elicits awe. Awe is a complex emotion evoked by two types of cognitive appraisals. One, perceived vastness, and two, a need for accommodation. In other words, you recognize that your existing mental schemas aren't sufficient to comprehend this new experience. You must open your mind to new knowledge, new understanding. What types of experiences elicit awe? Beautiful stimuli, including nature scenes, concepts in math and physics, and perceived moral beauty, have been shown to elicit awe, thereby inducing the effects of awe, which include increased well-being, smaller sense of self, increased sense of connectedness, more pro-social behavior, 
increase meaning in life via self-transcendent experiences, and transformation, defined by Chirico and Yadin in 2018 as a restructuring of individuals' inner world at the most intimate level. The effects of awe have been demonstrated neuroscientifically as well. For example, a 2019 study demonstrated reduced activation of the default mode network while participants were watching awe compared to generally positive and neutral videos. The default mode network is a set of brain regions, including the medial or middle, not lateral, part of the prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex involved in mind wandering and self-referential thought. Deactivation of this network, while participants watched awe videos, is in line with the awe-induced awe sense of small self. For example, the writer of the song, How Great Thou Art, likely experienced awe and maybe deactivation of the default mode network. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9, we read, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In this proclamation, we hear that sense of small self. We are small compared to God, and when we feel small, we may recognize his greatness. In contrast to the default mode network, which is active when an individual is at rest or not actively engaged in a task, the frontoparietal network is involved in focusing and directing attention towards an external stimulus or task. Regions in the frontoparietal network include the supramarginal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, and insula. The same 2019 study found that these regions were more active when participants were analyzing awe-inspiring compared to generally positive and neutral videos. These effects are in line with behavioral findings, suggesting that awe increases attentional capture, absorption, cognitive restructuring, and transformation. In line with the effects of beauty on awe, beauty has also been shown to awaken the intellect. Lavoli and colleagues, in their paper about a wilderness and beauty intervention, write, the experience of beauty simulates wonder. What is this beauty I am experiencing? Why is it so? They cite another published study by Sather and colleagues in 2017 showing that wonder motivates reflection and further search for insight. Thus, beauty stimulates wonder, which leads us onto a journey of discovery. We want to learn more about the world, about God's creation, and thus about him, artist and creator. In neuroscientific research, stimuli subjectively rated as beautiful relative to neutral recruited the left parietal cortex, a region involved in spatial attention. Overall, beauty engages our attention, makes us want to know more about that beauty, and when we ask that question, what is this beauty? We find out that it's Christ, summit of beauty. In Via Pulchritunanus, the Pontifical Council for Culture refers to the multitude of men and women who have let themselves be seized by this beauty to consecrate themselves to it. And Pope Benedict XVI explained that the saint is one who's so fascinated by the beauty of God that he is progressively transformed by it. But what does the field of psychology and neuroscience say about the power of beauty to transform us? The theory of embodied cognition states that when that what we perceive informs how we act. The field of neuroscience has substantiated this theory with the discovery of what some call mirror neurons. These are neurons that activate when we move, but also when we observe a particular movement. This was first demonstrated in animal research. A monkey's mirror neuron is at rest. 
When the monkey grasps the ball, the mirror neuron fires. It also fires when the monkey observes the experimenter grasping the ball. In this way, our brains are, in a sense, practicing and learning what we observe. The theory extends beyond simple action and includes perceptions of characteristics of objects. As such, when we observe beauty, whether in a harmonious theory or in a moral action, our beauty neurons are firing. Our brains are not only observing this beauty, but we are, in a sense, doing it. We are, maybe, becoming more beautiful. Given what we know about mirror neurons, such as that when we perceive, for example, moral beauty, our moral beauty mirror neurons are firing, it's not surprising that research shows that experiences of beauty evoke love. For example, one study showed that participants who saw pictures of more versus less beautiful nature were more generous when they played something called the dictator game, which involves giving money to others, more trusting when they played the trust game, and more likely to help make paper cranes for earthquake victims. In other work, perceptions of moral beauty, observing people acting in line with moral virtues, has been shown to lead to feelings of elevation, which was defined by Jonathan Haidt in 2002 as a distinctive feeling in the chest of warmth and expansion. It causes a desire to become a better person oneself and it seems to open one's heart, not only to the person who triggered the feeling, but also to other people. The feeling of elevation has been linked to increases in the hormone oxytocin, often called the cuddle or trust hormone. This hormone or endogenous chemical signal underlies social bonding and contributes to pro-social behavior. As such, experiences of moral beauty elicit more social and pro-social, more loving behavior. Overall, beauty evokes love, and we read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, everyone who loves knows God. So beauty evokes love. Love allows us to know God. As such, beauty psychologically and theologically leads to God. Here I discussed how truth is beautiful, Christ is the summit of beauty. From a scientific perspective, beauty delights, improves well-being, elicits awe, awakens the intellect, fosters more beauty, and evokes love. With all of this, it seems promising that the world, the unquenchable seekers of love, truth, and beauty, will see through perceptible beauty to eternal beauty, and with fervor discover holy God, the author of all beauty. Thank you, and again, I want to acknowledge Father Joseph Laracy for his contributions to this research. Thank you for your talk, that was awesome. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on navigating the distinction between subjective beauty versus beauty as one of the, transcend one of the transcendental properties of being, because that's an area where I sometimes, in just conversations with friends, when I'm describing beauty as something that leads me towards God, um, when they challenge me on like, okay, well what about areas where you might see this as beautiful, but someone else would find this to be more beautiful. So I was curious if you have thoughts on Navigating, navigating that discrepancy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess your question just makes me think of our individuality and how God is so personal and so unique to us and speaks to us in very unique um, ways that are in line with our own gifts and desires and needs and struggles. Um, so experiences of beauty are the same in that something that is in, um, strikes somebody as beautiful might be um, very different for somebody else. Um, but that, to me, it kind of, I guess, it, to me, it kind of points to God. 
um, you know, that these experiences of God are little, experiences of beauty are kind of encounters with God and they're very individualized um, and unique to each person. Thank you. Yes, that was quite, quite nice. Uh, um, and I liked all the chains that you had put together. The, the one item that I didn't see very much of, if I saw it all, was gratitude. Because I think of gratitude as an evocation that leads you to on to something else. Um, you might just comment on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's um, a really good point. Yeah, there are all these different new, kind of not new, but um, the field of positive psychology, I think, is identifying different things like gratitude and meaning in life. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know of the research. Um, I don't know if there's research showing that experiences of beauty evoke gratitude or vice versa, where you know feeling a deeper sense of gratitude might kind of prepare you to encounter beauty. Um, but it's very possible that that research exists. If not, it would be a great avenue for future research. So that's something to pursue. But, Can we train beauty? You know, um, when we think about young people and their self-esteem and what they see, we're always talking about what they see as being beautiful and them holding themselves to those standards. Um, and, you know, if we're going to get spiritual on it, or how much of them are they looking at these other people and saying, if that's beautiful, it should be leading me to... They're not saying this consciously. But if I don't look like that then I don't have that beautiful part of God in me. You know, how does that affect that? And can we train out of, right? Because even the studies were done with typical standards of beauty or typical standards of ugliness. But if we want to be able to see all people as these beautiful creations, are there, is there, is there any science on training beauty so that we could change how our young people see themselves in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. So first I thought you were asking about beauty interventions, and the answer would be yes. There are lots of interventions that have been done to teach people to look for beauty and appreciate beauty and engage with beauty. And when you do that, people do tend to engage with beauty more. So you can increase those traits of appreciation and engagement with beauty, and therefore inter, um, increase you know those other positive effects that I talked about. Um, as far as training the concept of beauty, um, so there's like the there's attractiveness and there's facial attractiveness and in the literature those are kind of looked at distinctly from experiences of kind of what I would say true beauty where you know beautiful nature um, moral beauty when you see people acting in line with moral virtues um, so I think there are really like two constructs there I think there's attractiveness and maybe a societal construct of beauty versus kind of true beauty which really elicits. Um, these deeply positive experiences versus um, like a desire to become more like that or a negative self-esteem. Um, but it's a really good point that there could also possibly be an intervention to kind of raise awareness of the distinction maybe between true beauty that deeply fulfills and elicits all these positive effects versus a societal kind of constructed version of beauty which you know, could lead to the things that you're saying, you know, lower self-esteem, and we see that being such a concern, especially with social media and youth right now. So, it's a great point, thank you. I think that question makes me consider that, you know, if you think about what you didn't know was beautiful before, and then you become aware of what is beautiful, and what I have seen in my own uh, life is the more you get to know about something, the, the deeper you get into experiencing or studying it or g gaining knowledge about it. And the one thing that comes to my mind is um, when I was a kid, we had a farm. And we had, uh, later in my, when I was in high school, we, got, we had sheep. And I was in the 4-H club. And I learned about you know, what the perfect sheep looked like, you know, that it had perfect confirmation and uh, you know various concepts and different breeds had different areas of perfection and I remember telling somebody I can tell you what a beautiful sheep looks like <laughs> so and then the other thing I recall you know, being in college um, in calculus class my um, 
<coughs> teacher who looked like, um, what's her name, Hepburn? Uh, oh, Catherine, Catherine Hepburn. She, and we, were, we had blackboards back then. She'd be writing and writing and writing, you know, various uh, 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 proofs or whatever, and then she would lean against the backboard and say, isn't it elegant, girls? It was an all women's college. And it took me a while to figure out the elegance. But then, you know, later I said, yeah, that is beautiful. So I think mm -hmm. that's a way we could train people. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I often think about, you know, the inner cities, and I lived for a while in some struggling neighborhoods, and I felt like, wow, you know, there's such a need for exposure to beauty. And, you know, that has been done, you know, in little bits, but it's not kind of accepted as there are no really public policies insisting that we need exposure to beauty, you know, in schools and in cities. Um, but I think that would be great. And then also your comments, both of your comments made me think of unity and diversity. So there's this concept of, um, you know, that the most beautiful is really our diversity and how different each person is. So rather than the perfect looking sheep or the perfect looking human who's posted on social media and, you know, the perfect pose and everything, um, that it's our diversity that's truly and deeply the most beautiful. But I think there could be ways, um, to both of your points, to kind of foster that appreciation of the beauty and the diversity of the human person. So your, your talk made me remember something that Solzhenitsyn said. I don't remember which speech he said it in, that there are three trees that reach very high up to the same place, and those are the tree of goodness, of truth, and of beauty. And that modern man has cut down the tree of truth and the tree of goodness, but the tree of beauty remains, and he said, beauty will save the world. Uh, I was wondering if you yeah, heard of that. Thank you, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and then I think this will be the last question for the next talk. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on <clears throat> um, deceptive beauty. Because, you know, we have, like, I remember in graduate school, I was talking to a guy, and he was talk, we were talking about how I didn't approve of a certain um, um, disordered sexual relationship. And he's saying, how can you disapprove of that? It's so beautiful, right? And then we look at, the crucifix, it's, I mean, superficially, it's not beautiful, right? We've got to learn how to appreciate the beauty of it. Actually, I think Benedict the Sixteenth has a talk uh, about how we, about the, the two images of Christ being both beautiful in one of the Psalms where he says, how beautiful you are, you know, with the, your sword in your thigh. It's, uh, and then it also the suffering servant, how he's marred and he's disfigured. Um, I was wondering if you just comment on, on, on um, deceptive beauty, a beauty that's hidden or also beauty that's false. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, it kind of goes back to that idea of like there are these two separate constructs almost of beauty, what society has constructed to be beautiful. Um, in the sense of a, the disordered sexual relationship, I feel like it could be that somebody maybe was, um, you know, seeing some sense of moral beauty if there was caring or something between people. That I don't know that that was the case. Um, and then the sense of Christ um, in that hidden beauty. Um, it, it reminds me also of, I don't know your name, but the person who commented previously um, about how can we foster this sense of appreciation of true beauty and kind of defining what beauty really is and that there is beauty in suffering and there is beauty in kind of persevering through life's challenges and offering oneself to God and giving oneself to God. Um, and I think that's you know maybe why we see beauty in Christ is that we see that love, we see that sense of total self-gift and it's that, that perfect love that strikes us as being truly beautiful. Um, but yeah, of course, there's, there's deception, there's confusion. Um, but hopefully we can you know, continue to foster appreciation and seeking of the truest beauty that leads to truth. 